Today is Pentecost Sunday. So 50 days ago, we gathered here with the image of an empty tomb before us. And we worshiped together and declared, He is risen. He is risen indeed. Right? We proclaimed the resurrection of Jesus. And we celebrated the truth that this constant prayer, the prayer that we just prayed for God's kingdom to come on earth, as it is in heaven, this prayer is, is coming true, right? In the resurrection of Jesus, heaven has invaded earth in, in a reality-altering way. And, and we've been celebrating this over the past 50 days. Uh, we've been dwelling in this passage of encounter with the risen Lord. We've been reading various pieces from uh, throughout Acts when the apostles and the disciples proclaim resurrection to the people. Uh, it, it, it's incredible, the, this 50-day celebration of resurrection. And so today, the 50th day since this great celebration is known as the day of Pentecost which is simply the word for 50th. That's all that the word Pentecost means, is 50th. And originally, Pentecost was the name of a Jewish celebration that was celebrated 50 days after the Passover. Um, but for disciples of Jesus, Pentecost took on a whole new meaning. Because on the 50th day, after the resurrection, there was another powerful on earth as it is in heaven moment that occurred. Acts chapter 2 describes this moment as rushing winds, flickering flames, and the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit. So just like Easter is a day to remember the resurrection, Pentecost is a day to remember the Holy Spirit who has come to be with us. It's a day to celebrate the presence of God with us and in us as we continue to seek this kingdom and pray for the arrival of, its, of, of heaven on earth, right? It, this kingdom's arrival on earth as it is in heaven. It's a day of celebration. But... It can be very difficult to celebrate the presence of God in the midst of a world where there is so much chaos and so much pain. Last Sunday, as we gathered together, we shared a moment of silence after the news of 21 deaths, 19 of which were children young children at school, and two adults, in a Texas elementary school shooting. After last Sunday, I saw a disturbing and, and shocking headline that read, over Memorial Day weekend alone, there were 14 mass shootings in the United States of America. Fourteen. A mass shooting is defined as a shooting where four or more people are injured. Across the country, over Memorial Day weekend, there were at least nine people killed. More than 60 people wounded. And then after the holiday weekend, many of us saw news this past week of yet another shooting in yet another unlikely place this time a hospital in Tulsa, Oklahoma. A place meant for healing became a place of great harm. Four people were killed there. Several more were injured. You know, all of this that's going on in the world around us, and, and we are still very aware of this war that rages in the Ukraine, of refugees that are seeking safety after their homes have been destroyed. Violence, death, destruction. 
how are we supposed to celebrate the presence of God when we're so aware of all these things? How do we celebrate the presence of God in the midst of a world that seems so God-less? Well, we're not the first ones to wrestle with this question. If you have your Bible, open up to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 is where we are headed together this morning. Romans 8 is an incredible chapter. It is an extensive and practical and, and theological reflection on the Holy Spirit. Many Bibles, as you're turning there, uh, may very well have a heading right over Romans chapter 8 that reads something to the effect of life in the Spirit. Life in the Spirit. In this chapter, Romans chapter 8, Paul is celebrating the presence of the Holy Spirit. If you look at verse 11, he writes that the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. That's amazing, right? The, the very spirit who overcame the power of the grave and brought Jesus into resurrection, that same spirit dwells in you in those who proclaim Christ as Lord. And yet, Paul also wrestles with the reality of suffering in the world. He wrestles with the, the fact that, that this place is not as it should be. This place is very broken. And as he wrestles with this tension between celebration and suffering, he writes that it is actually precisely amidst this pain that the Holy Spirit has a profound presence. And so let's read together. Romans chapter 8, we'll begin in verse 22. Romans 8, beginning in verse 22. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly. As we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Amen. Let's pray. O oh Lord, thank you for the gift of your word and for the gift of your Holy Spirit, who is with us in the groans of pain and suffering. God, help us to hear your word for us this morning. I pray that as we consider your scripture, that you would sharpen our minds and soften our hearts, that we might know you and love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So this passage about the Holy Spirit 
It was also about the groaning and the suffering of our world. Verse 22 begins, We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up into this present time. Right up into this present time. The whole of creation is groaning. And we know it. We are well aware of the suffering around us. It is hard to miss the groaning of the world around us. Now, Paul wrote this about 2,000 years ago, uh, before there was radio, before there was television, before there was internet and social media and constant beeping of notifications on our little devices. 2,000 years ago, Paul wrote confidently, hey, we know that the whole of creation is groaning. We know it, right? All these years later, we are only exponentially more aware of the groaning of the world around us. In, in Paul's day, people would eventually become aware of wars that were raging across the world. They would eventually hear about such a thing, but they would often, you know, it'd take a while to get to, for them to hear it, for them to know this, and, and they would have no idea about some of these other crimes or, or things that would happen. But today, we know immediately. We know immediately at the chime of our cell phones what's going on, not only next door, not only uh, in our cities. We know what's going on across the world. We know it immediately, what is going on. And so, more than any other time in history, verse 22 is absolutely true, right? We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. So we are well aware of this, but, but here's the question. How do we respond to these groanings? How do we respond to so much information, so much knowledge? Because groaning is, is very inconvenient, isn't it? I'd rather not know about all the groaning that's going on. Groaning interrupts our preference for tidy, comfortable lives. And our culture is masterful at shutting out the groans. Our, our culture is built around pretending like there aren't groans in the world. Sometimes we simply ignore them, right? We would try to drown them out with distractions and, and entertainment. Sometimes we depersonalize the groans by filing them under the category of politics, right? Oh, that's just politics. I don't have anything to do with that. Really? Sometimes we sentimentalize the groans. Little cliches, little, you know, Hallmark card greetings that essentially just tell people, hey, cheer up, snap out of it. Get over it. Sometimes we don't just sentimentalize things. We spiritualize things. With, with this increasingly uh, meaningless phrase, thoughts and prayers, right? You know, oh, our thoughts and prayers. You know, we mean the best when we say it, but what does that really mean? Or sometimes in the midst of suffering, we just tell people, hey, you got to just have more faith. As if somehow faith is a magic wand that zaps away suffering and groaning. Every single one of these things, you know, ignoring, ignoring something, uh, distancing ourselves from it, sentimentalizing it or spiritualizing it in some way, every single one of these things is a response to the groaning of creation that, that we are all very well aware of. 
We witness these kinds of responses every day, and we often participate in them ourselves because it's so ingrained in us. We don't want to get too close to the groaning. And often we actually do this because we think it's for the best, right? We think that we're right to distance ourselves, to avoid things that sound or seem too political. Uh, we, we think it's right and good to offer nice sentiments or spiritual words. We think that this is the good spiritual thing to do. But I want to pay attention to where Paul goes next in this passage right? We know the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And then verse 23, but not only so, we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption, the redemption of our bodies. So Paul writes that as we are increasingly aware of the groaning of creation around us, instead of avoiding it, ignoring it, sentimentalizing or spiritualizing it, we join it. We join in that groaning. We move from knowing that there is groaning around us to we ourselves are groaning inwardly. This is exactly what it means to be spiritual people. It could be easy to think that as people filled with the Spirit, we are somehow exempt from all of this pain and suffering. But what does Paul say? We ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly. It's because we have the Spirit that we're groaning. The Spirit doesn't exempt us from that. He draws us into it. In the next couple of verses, Paul connects this state of groaning with the hope that we have which doesn't make much sense to us, right? What do you mean hope and groaning? These, those don't go together, but, but here's the deal. Being spirit-filled, hopeful people does not mean being an optimistic, happy-go-lucky people. In fact, in many ways, being spirit-filled people means that we will groan even more than everyone else. We will groan even more than the rest of the world. Being spirit-filled people with a deep-set hope means that we will sense the world's brokenness even more. Let me put it this way. I grew up in a broken home. My parents divorced before I was even a year old. And my whole life, I grew up between these two different homes in the midst of this divorced family. And it, it, it shaped me quite a bit. It was a painful experience. I often, growing up, felt this sense of homelessness, right? Is it, is it here or there? I don't know. You know, is it both? Well, home is is kind of is one place. What does this mean, right? And, and so I wrestled with this throughout my life. But, but here's the deal. As much as that shaped me and formed me, there are many ways in which I, I never knew the difference. That, that's, I, I was less than a year old whenever my parents got divorced. That's all I ever knew. I was so young when it all happened. I never knew anything different. But my older brother was eight when my parents divorced. He was eight years old. In that season of divorce, and the rest of his growing up was remarkably painful. Because he did know the difference 
He had grown up for eight years, knowing what it was like to have parents who were married to one another, who loved one another, having one family, one home. And he knew what it was like for all of that to fall apart and become broken. And so his groaning became even more pronounced than any groaning that that I did growing up in that same context. And so so here's, here's what I'm saying. People who live in the world apart from Christ, apart from the the filling of the Holy Spirit, uh, have an experience much more like me growing up in a divorced home, right? They know there's something wrong. This is not the way it's meant to be, but they don't know any different, right? There's a groaning, but I I don't really know what else it could look like. This is all that I've ever seen. But those of us who do know Christ, those of us who who have experienced, been, been filled, live life in the presence of the Spirit, are much more like my older brother in his experience growing up in a divorced home. Because, because of the life of Christ, because of the presence of the Spirit, we know some measure of life as it's meant to be. We know a little bit about what creation, what what life was supposed to be. And so we are even more aware of the ways that it's not like that. Because we have tasted the goodness of the Spirit, we're even more aware of the bitterness of pain And so, we groan. We groan. This is actually what it means to be a people of hope. This is actually what it means to be hopeful people. You might think, that's not what I imagine when I think of hopeful people. People groaning? Yeah, that's what it means to be people of hope. Because being hopeful does not mean being chipper. Because we are utterly convinced of this hope, we groan with the rest of creation as we ache and wait and long for that redemption to finally and fully come. That's what it means to have hope. If we're going to be a people of hope, then we are going to be a people of heartbreak. Because we're going to know what it's like when things are broken. We know the groaning of creation, and so we ourselves groan inwardly with it. So creation is groaning, right? We are groaning. What is God doing? What is God up to? This is one of the biggest questions of today, right? Look around at this chaotic, violent, senseless world. Where in the world is God? That seems like great evidence that God's not doing much of anything, right? We've probably heard it. It's one of the great objections to this idea of God. This world is is chaotic. It's senseless. What is God doing in the midst of all this? Well, look at verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. What is God doing? God's also groaning. The Spirit is also groaning. Just as God the Son took on flesh and suffered on the cross, so God the Spirit 
takes on our suffering and groans with us. Jesus came to dwell with us and suffer among us. The Spirit, too, has come to groan with us and suffer among us. And our very spirits. And the groans of the Spirit are surely far deeper than ours ever could be. Right? We know the groaning of creation, and so we groan, but God, the Spirit, is all-knowing, infinitely more aware of the pain of the world. And so the Spirit groans even more deeply. And what does this tell us about the heart of God? What does this tell us about who God is? Well, in verse 27, Paul writes that the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. What is this intercession that the Spirit is doing in accordance with the will of God? Well, it's it's wordless groans. It's wordless groans. That's the intercession that the Spirit is doing. The fact that the Spirit is interceding with groans shows us that pain and suffering are not God's will for this world. The Spirit of God is protesting it. God himself is saying, this is not how it's supposed to be. A lot of times we talk as though everything that happens is somehow God's will. I don't know where we got that idea. Because this passage seems to suggest that there are plenty of things going on in the world that are exactly not God's will. And so the Spirit is groaning. God groans. A lot of times we see these acts of senseless violence and endless wars, and we ask, God, what are you doing? Scripture tells us what God is doing. God is groaning. God is weeping. This is not the way it was supposed to be. This isn't the creation that I made. It's been warped and broken. We can only see the goodness of God. I want you to listen to this. We can only see the goodness of God in the midst of suffering, when by the Spirit we hear the groaning of God in the midst of suffering. We can only see the goodness of God in the midst of suffering when by the Spirit we hear the groaning of God in the midst of suffering. It is God's groaning that reveals God's goodness. As long as we see God as some kind of distant, cosmic micromanager, we will look at the suffering of the world and question his goodness. God, isn't there some sort of switch you can flip to fix all of this? As long as we see God that way, we'll ask that question, and we will doubt or deny God's goodness. But when the Spirit shows us that God is right here, right here, groaning with us, well, then we'll know that God longs for goodness for his children. God longs for goodness for the world that he created. There's not a magic cosmic switch to be flipped. 
Instead, God sent his spirit who groans with us, who transforms us so that we might transform the world around us. God is right here with us, groaning. That's how we see God's goodness. And it's only through this groaning that we finally arrive at verse 28. And we know that in all these things, God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28 is not a Hallmark card and should never be read by itself, ever. It is only through the deep, painful groans of the rest of chapter 8 that we finally arrive at this hard-fought, deep, groaning goodness of God. Romans 8, 28 is not a magic switch. Romans 8, 28 we only arrive at this verse through the deep groaning of the Spirit among us. It's in the midst of God's groaning that we see God's goodness. God is good, and he longs for goodness in this world. And we're convinced of this because God himself is groaning at all the things that are wrong. This is what the Spirit is doing among us. And he has called us according to his purpose. He has called us to be part of this goodness that he wishes for his world. He has called us to be his children of light in the midst of darkness. This is what the Spirit of God is doing. And so as the sermon comes to a close, I just want to say a few things. And I want to invite us to look a little more deeply at this image that has been before us this morning. Uh, this is a, an art piece by an artist named Scott Erickson. It's called The Sorrowful Saint. And I think it's a beautiful image of what we've been talking about this morning. Of the ways in which our groaning is actually a way of declaring the kingdom of God. So I just want to say a few things about this. Our groans, our tears. I want to say three things about them. Our tears are prayer. For the world. Our groaning and our tears are a way of praying for the world. Some of you say, I don't know how to pray. I don't, I, I don't know how, I don't, I'm not a praying person. I mean, I want to pray, but I don't really know how to do that. I don't have the words, right? I don't know what words to say. The Spirit is interceding with groans too deep for words. You don't need words to pray. Our tears are prayer enough. Our tears are prayers for the world. We need to move our awareness of the suffering that's going on down into our spirits where the Spirit of God will meet us so that our tears can become a prayer for this world to be renewed but our tears are also a proclamation to the world. In our groaning, we are saying, this is not how it's supposed to be. There is a world better than this. There is a kingdom beyond this. This is not the way God intended it to be. And so by groaning, we're not resigning ourselves to this world. We're maintaining hope that God's going to make this right one day. 
our tears, our groaning, is a proclamation to the world that there's more than this. Whenever we see headlines come through every day, the ache in our heart is not only a prayer for God to make all things new, but a proclamation that God will make all things new. But it's not proclaimed by shouting it at people. It's proclaimed by groaning with the ones who are groaning. And it is in this way that our tears are actually watering the seeds of the kingdom. And that's what I love about this picture. If you can't quite make it out, down at the bottom, uh, that little garden plot is in the shape of a casket. And so it's directly in the face of death that this sorrowful saint pours out their groaning and their tears. And through those tears, new life begins to spring up. Resurrection begins to come forth out of death. Our tears, our prayers for the world, proclamation to the world, and are the means by which the seeds of the kingdom are watered. Every week we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our tears water the growth of that kingdom. So may we be a people who groan with the Spirit and in these groans proclaim that the kingdom will come.